Well, happy Sabbath, everyone, again, and we're going to go into the next study. Before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, we invite your Spirit's presence to speak to us today, to once again to heed your voice, to listen and obey. We know, Lord, that um, there's that we have sinned, that there's much that we have neglected, and um, in our responsibilities to you and to those around us. We just ask, Lord, that you can help us as we study these things to encourage us, that your Holy Spirit can strengthen us, and that we can decide to follow you. Bless each person who watch these, watches these videos, those that participate. Help us in the ministry around us that we sometimes neglect and don't see. Help us to realize that uh, not only are angels watching, but the people around us observe us. And we just pray, Lord, that um, they will be drawn to you by what they see. Be with us now in this study. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, happy Sabbath again, everyone. And uh, we're continuing this study addressing, uh, well, the crisis ahead. Uh, again, it was a study that we had gone through in the upper room studies in my early time as times as a Seventh-day Adventist. And uh, I receive a blessing from going through this again, being remind, reminded of the many scriptures or, and passages in spirit of prophecy that I was drawn to initially when I became an Adventist. So we we have read this this here. I just want to look at this last uh thought here before we go into so the question that's being asked here is what should we be doing now in order to be ready when brought to trial for our faith i mean the purpose of being brought to trial is is what why why are we going to be brought to trial for our faith what what's the point of that to share with the lovers okay yeah so that that other people can hear the message right now also we know that we we have opportunity now to develop a Christ-like character, and our character will be demonstrated as to whether it's Christ-like or not as we face some of these trials ahead. But this this one question, and I'm not really sure uh, how that answers the question, other than you know we need to understand the oracles of God. They need to have a systematic knowledge of the principles of revealed truth which will fit them for what is coming upon the earth and prevent them from being carried about by every wind of doctrine. You know, and we discussed about these winds of doctrine uh, that, that we believe that these are part of, of a trial so that I, it doesn't say this explicitly in this statement, but we know there's a statement in the spirit of prophecy that, that got the doc, false doctrine is going to be allowed to come into the church because it forces us to study. And, and we see these winds of doctrine everywhere. And we see how much damage they do. I guess winds of doctrine uh, can do damage just like hurricanes can. So the next, the next uh, quote from 5T 546, our people have been regarded as too insignificant to be worthy of notice. But a change will come. The Christian world is now making movements which will necessarily bring commandment-keeping people into prominence. Every position of our faith will be searched into. And if we are not thorough Bible students, established, strengthened, and settled, the wisdom of the world's great men will lead us astray. Not, not just that, they, that we won't be able to uh, convince them, but they will be able to convince us. None but those who have fortified the mind with the truths of the Bible will stand through the last great conflict. Now, of course, we can see this is the intellectual part, intellectually and spiritually, right? That is, we're going to settling into the truth, uh, both intellectually and spiritually is what? Ellen White says that there's something that is a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually. What is she referring to? Being sealed. Yeah, to be sealed, right? To receive the seal of God is to be settled into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually. So we know that there is an intellectual aspect. 
Now, what do we mean by spiritually? I mean, we throw that word around a lot, spiritual. What, what does it mean to be intellectually and spiritually? And Character, really. Okay, right. So what we understand intellectually is put into practice, right? So it's not, spiritually isn't like some kind of feeling or, you know, it's, it's not something that's uh, indefinite or unclear. It's not just a fancy word put in, the, in there. It, it means that we, we are affected by the things that we study. So when we fortify our minds with the truths of the Bible, we think about a fortification, we protect ourselves so that we won't be led astray, that we can fight against uh, these battles that are going on. And so it's, it's God's word that does that. Now, some people think that what we need to do is we need to study in uh, the world's schools and become highly intellectual. Is that going to fortify our mind so that we will know what is true? If we receive a worldly education, does that fit us uh, for God's kingdom? No. No. Now, it doesn't mean we don't believe that. Or, or doesn't mean we believe that, you know, people shouldn't be educated at all. I mean, we need to be educated, but not after the world, right? We need to be disciplined in our study of God's word. We need to know how to read. We need to know, know how to write properly. Um, and, and sometimes going to an educational institution can help you do that. But there's also a philosophy in, in the world's educational system that flatters the intellect that flatters the ego of those who who fall into the trap of that system. And I've seen it, I've seen people who get an education and who were once humble Christians and they come out of that institution, you know, arrogant, self-sufficient and, and looking down upon other people. So they, they've, they got caught in that trap. So, you know, some people can be caught in the trap of thinking that because they're not educated, that they they know better. Um, there is we did we do need to be educated, but it has to be a proper education. Some people are just lazy, and they just think this and think that, and never take the time to study. So so we need we need a mind that's fortified with the truths of the Bible, and those help us wade through all of the garbage that exists in this world. It gives us insight into what we see happening around us. Now, the next question, number seven, it's a good number for this one. What is even more important than the ability to give a reason for our faith? And this, so this is one I like. The ability to give a reason for our faith is a good accomplishment. But if the truth does not go deeper than this, the soul will never be saved. The heart must be purified from all moral defilement. So I take the intellectually and spiritually that we talked about. Intellectually, that's the mind, but the heart. Now, of course, we know that the heart pumps our blood, and, but in, and it's a symbol. So the heart has, what is the heart in a biblical sense? So we got the mind, the intellect. Emotional. Okay, we think emotional. That's that's not really what the Bible has as the word heart. Well, I've heard scientists say that the heart is one of our three brains. So there's the actual brain. Yeah, I've heard that too. Head, there's the heart. Uh, there's, there's the bowels. Yeah, I don't quite agree with that. I, I've seen that those kinds of statements. I mean, the heart itself does not make decisions for us, right? But the Bible is has the heart as the part of us that makes moral decisions, right? Would people agree with me on that? I uh, use that that expression. I always was, was calling it the the inward man or the inward person, who you really are in essence. Yeah, it, it's it, the heart is is it, it's it's the part of us that there's definitely emotions attached to it, right? because it talks about the thoughts and intents of the heart, right? So the heart has thoughts and it has intents, right? So when we talk about the mind as opposed to the heart, 
the mind from a biblical perspective, and we, we could do a study on this, but the mind is also involved in decisions, right? So, so why does the Bible distinguish between a heart and mind? Anybody have thoughts on that? I mean, in some ways they overlap, right? But when we think about the mind. Theodore. Yep. May I make a comment? This is Kathy, Keith's wife, William's wife. Yep. Um, the heart is more emotional, and especially for women, because it's Okay, that last bit got cut off. You said especially for women, and then I didn't hear the rest of that. I heard all that before that. Okay, so when we think about the heart, it's definitely more emotional. But the, the Bible does use um, uh, the reins for what we call emotion, that is the kidneys. Okay, you're kind of broken up there, Kathy. I can't, I can't hear everything. It's mostly silence. Oh, she's gone. But to, com to comment on that, so... There are different types of emotions, right? So why does the Bible talk about the reins or the kidneys as the source of emotions? What is it talking about there? And God, you know, he also tries the reins, right? That he tests our reins. So we got we got the mind, we have the heart, we have the reins or the kidneys. Why is the Bible using these terms? What do they mean? Probably we should do a, a study on this. Because this is something that uh, generally we just throw these terms around without looking at how the Bible uses them. Yeah, it'd be, that would be good to have a study on this. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the reins, I understand to be more those, because there's different types of emotions. I look at the reins as more the source of, of sorrow as an emotion does that make sense to people I, I don't know you know how we could classify these different types of emotions you have you know you have sorrow you have love love we think is from the heart sorrow is from the reins i mean you can be sorrowful of heart too right so the bible isn't always you know consistent in how it looks at this um, and of course, the reins or the kidneys are not used very often in, in, I don't think they're used in the New Testament. I know they're used in the Old Testament. But when we think about the mind, um, we're thinking mostly about our reason, right? And that's where we store knowledge, right? That would be connected with the mind. And there is a decision process in the mind, but there's also a decision process in the heart. So trying to ask this question, I want us to think about this. So if we think about reason, I mean, I tend to be a fairly reasonable person. I tend to be much more intellectual than emotional. Let's put it that way. Uh, I don't make a lot of emotional decisions. But some people make emotional decisions. That is, they're motivated by their emotions to do this or that. Now, sometimes that can be good, right? <laughs> you know, compassion is, is an emotion. And to be compassionate, people will do things that, that are compassionate. So they're, they're all mixed together. It, it's not as clear cut. But we say, the so when we have this idea that Ellen White says, the ability to give a reason for our faith, that would be our mind, our reasoning power, is a good accomplishment. But if the truth does not go deeper than this, the soul will never be saved. The heart must be purified from all moral defilement so when we think about the heart here in this context ellen white's connecting the heart to our morality right now of course sin can be connected to the mind as well but a person can think good thoughts but he is he is morally corrupt so that would be the spiritual part if we're going to put it in there. Hi, Kathy. I, I was answering your question a little bit here, but uh, you have to watch the video later uh, to see the answer. She's back. Okay. <clears throat> so this next quote here, and that was from Our High Calling, that one. This one's, again, from Our High Calling 356. She disappeared again. 
You are now to get ready for the time of trial. Now you are to know whether your feet are planted on the eternal rock. You must have an individual experience and not depend upon others for your light. When you are brought to the test, how do you know that you will not be alone? With no earthly friend at your side, will you then be able to realize that Christ is your support? So, so often we're put into situations where all we have is Christ. And that's good, right? Um, we learn to depend upon him. You know, Ellen White makes a statement, every earthly support shall be removed, you know, at some point. And um, there are some people who cannot stand on their own. They need others to solve their problems for them. And yet God puts us in situations where we can learn to depend upon him. What is the purpose of these public trials? God means that testing truth shall be brought to the front and become a subject of examination and discussion, even if it is through the contempt placed upon it. Every reproach, every slander will be God's means of provoking inquiry and awakening minds that others would slumber, that otherwise would slumber. So, so sometimes these issues, these controversies draw attention uh, to this. I, I, I know lately I've, I've heard this thing called the, the Streisand effect. So something to do with Barbara Streisand imposing something, and it actually just drew attention to, I think it was her address or something where she lived. And so it just made it more public. We would see something similar to what happened to Kelly Ross at Calgary Central, where nobody had heard about the 2520 uh, there, maybe a couple of people. And, you know, it's announced, you know, there's this 2520 doctrine, don't listen to it. Well, of course, that draws attention to it. So even when, uh, you know, these issues are brought um, in a negative sense, it draws attention to them. And inquiring minds look into these things. You know, Donald Trump has kind of figured that out. You know, there's no such thing as uh, bad publicity. Actually, it's only how you react to the bad publicity that's that's the problem for most people. Okay. Now, now we have to think about this. I mean, obviously, this is in preparation. So, uh, for the things that are coming on this world, and um, we can see that uh, you know what was presented there in Zechariah that that often people are not not thinking about the fact that they have to represent God, which is obviously uh, the main thing that we're here for. We're here to represent God's character, to witness to the world. Now, this, this next section here, Satan's Miracles, is, is a little bit of a shift. Now, it has a lot of Bible verses. And I remember studying this, uh, uh, this section in the Upper Room Bible Studies. Um, was spirit, Spiritism a problem in Bible times. So, I mean, we know about that, obviously, but there was warnings against it. Uh, we could look at some of these verses. Exodus 22, 18. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Leviticus 20, uh, verse 6. And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards, to go a whoring after them, I will even set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. Um, Deuteronomy 18, verse 9 to 12. And when thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire or that useth din divination or an observer of times. Um, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination. Of course, they have lots of these different terms. The divination is uh, um, sort of it's, it means lots of different things. It comes from uh, the word a lot, right? The word. So it's basically uh, predicting the future, right? Divining it. 
an observer of the times that is uh, a soothsayer or a sorcerer, an enchanter, and somebody who, who makes spells, a witch, uh, is also connected with spells, and a charmer, um, also connected with spells. Um, so there's lots of these different terms. Now, how do we see these things nowadays? I mean, uh, I mean, there are people who go and they want their palm read or they want their their tarot cards read. Is is this the main problem that we're dealing with here nowadays? Well, it's false doctrine. When, when well, one of the doctrines is the problem. But, but Satan has sort of uh, changed his tactic for the modern mind, right? Yeah, I'd say so, yeah. He, he disguises these things. So... So sure, there are some people who, you know, get their bee leaves read and things like that. Um, I'm not sure how seriously people take all of that. There are people, um, there has been radio programs, you know, where they'd have some guest and, you know, and uh, people would phone in and he would, you know, predict what's going to happen to them and um, kind of stuff. It's all just, uh, you know charlatans some of it may be satanic in that sense that satan is actually involved but we know that it says how did satan at times personate something or someone more attractive than himself so genesis 3 verse 1 to 5 we're familiar with came in the form of a serpent which was not a snake but a bird a flying creature of some sort and in 1 Samuel 28, verse 6 to 14, everybody knows what that one is, right? Who did he personate? Anybody want to give give a guess? It's the story of the Witch of Andor, right? And he's going to personate Samuel. Yeah, I think King James says it was not Samuel. Yeah, it was not Samuel. I wish the King James had specified it was a demon impersonating Samuel. So when people get on my case and I say I don't I don't think that that the King James is infallible I think there are some mistranslations boy I get pounded for that one um, where, <laughs> which it is, was not Samuel it was a devil in person does it say does it say that in the original language somewhere I didn't check. I don't know I haven't checked it at least I don't recall checking it but that troubles me I mean I use yeah I used to channel like I used to see demons. And just and then when, I, then when I came to Christ and I started reading this in the King James, I said, "Well, then they must have believed. They must have the people that translated this must have believed that they're demon that that these people are that when you bring somebody up supposedly from the dead, that that's a person. No, it's not. <laughs> like accepting the state of the dead was the hardest battle when I joined the church. And it was okay. so difficult that when I I did accept it, uh, and a, a a demon appeared in my room and tried to tempt me to suicide." This is how strong this doctrine is. This is how strongly the devil will fight. Yeah, you know, and, and I said, Jesus, you take care of this. You, you get this thing up. Yeah, it, it's hard for me to and, and rescue me. Yeah, it's hard for me to appreciate um, the deception that's connected with this for many people, right? I mean, I'm not saying that I, I always believed in the, the, the understanding of the dead, but, you know, I've never imagined that the dead were watching us or um, never really, you know, considered like ghosts and things like that as real, you know, so it wasn't, it wasn't really a part of my, my, you know, something that I talked about or thought about or, or anything like that. I was definitely not interested in uh, anything that was, um, you know, witchcraft or spiritual or like Ouija boards or anything like that. I just, would have nothing to do with anything like that. Not sure why, particularly. Just, I, I just didn't have an interest in it. But uh, I know for some people, it, it can be uh, quite a, quite an issue, right? So, I was much more concerned, and I, and I still am, as a Seventh Day Adventist, about Satan's ability to deceive us. So we know that um, he's able to transform himself form himself into an angel of light. And we know that he's going to perform miracles in the last days, right? Now, this is going to go a bit more into 
modern spiritualism. So this new form of spiritualism, which um, is affects Christianity as well. So, I mean, one of the things that I would see with, uh, um, you know, like speaking in tongues and things like that, which Ellen White isn't really addressing here, but I do see it as connected to spiritualism. And uh, there's, there's lots of, uh, you know, spiritualistic uh, religions, um, some of these shamanistic religions, where speaking in tongues is part of it. But anyway, she's going to deal here with modern spiritualism, this new form. I saw that the mysterious knocking in New York and other places was the power of Satan, and that such things would be more and more common, clothed in a religious garb, so as to lull the deceived to greater security, to draw the minds of God's people, if possible, to those things, and cause them to doubt the teachings and power of the Holy Ghost. The mysterious wrapping with which modern spiritualism began was not the result of human trickery or cunning, it was the direct work of evil angels. Now, there are those who claim that it that there was human trickery involved, that they were just cracking their knuckles or something like that. But Ellen White says that there was you no, know, it wasn't the result of human trickery. Even if the humans themselves thought that they were doing something that was connected with trickery, Satan was involved in it, that this was purposeful. In what way is spiritualism now changing its form? Spiritualism is now changing its form and veiling some of its more objectionable features. Um, veiling some of its more object, objectionable features is assuming a Christian guise. While, while it formerly denounced Christ in the Bible, it now professes to accept both. And we've seen a lot of that happening. So, um, and you see it in some of the major uh, religions so really it's spiritualism that has taken on uh, Christianity. I'm familiar with lots of these types of ideas. I've seen lots of uh, Christian groups, especially, you know, in the 1960s, you saw a proliferation of sort of new age religion mixed with Christianity, which has um, some of them has become fairly mainstream. Um, and people just don't know the difference. What is, what is Satan now making special preparation for? Satan has long been preparing for his final effort to deceive the world. Little by little, he has prepared the way for his masterpiece piece of deception in the development of spiritualism. The spirit of God is gradually withdrawing from the world. Satan is also mustering his evil force, his forces of evil, going forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them under his banner, to be trained for the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Now we know that that, that battle where he's going to gather the kings of the whole earth and of the whole world is uh, what is that? When is that final battle? It's a great day of God almighty. Isn't that just before uh, Satan and all his horde are killed? Are blotted out forever. Okay. Well, it's quoting a passage of scripture. That's going to be the sixth plague, right? I saw three unclean spirits. Come out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false uh, false prophet. And these are um, going to go going forth to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to, under his batter, banner, right, to, to be trained for the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Obviously, we're mix, she's mixing those that verse together, right? She's taking parts of it and putting some of her own words in there. So under the sixth plague, and Ellen White's going to place that, of course. The plagues are after the close of probation. And, and we know that Satan would deceive, if possible, the very elect. So it, it's going to come up in this, this paper about the different views regarding when Satan's personation of Christ occurs. So generally speaking, I have found that most Adventists I've run into through the years take that rhetorical um, phrase to deceive, if possible, the very elect and believe that it must occur before the probation, the close of probation, uh, because after the close of probation, nobody could be deceived who's who's the elect, right? They're they're righteous. But really, what Satan is trying to do, to do to do is to deceive the elect. If Satan, after the close of probation, can deceive the elect, what would happen? 
if those that God has declared righteous are deceived, what 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 why is Satan so interested in this battle? What would happen? He would win. Yeah, he would win, right? So and we've done this in some of our other studies. We looked at some statements in the spirit of prophecy. Um, in particular, when we were studying early writings, page 74, we came across a statement of Ellen White's where she was discussing the close of probation. And um, when Satan, when Christ is going to confess the sins upon the head of the scapegoat, that that's going to occur at the time probation closes. And that that period of the time of the plagues is when the scapegoat is seeking to escape from the one, the fit man who's leading it into the wilderness. And if he would be successful, right, he would win because it would show that God can't judge the heart, that he can't, that he can't secure those that have made a choice to continue to follow him. And so they're going to be tested under the most trying circumstances, just as Christ was when he was crucified. So the 144,000 during the time of Jacob's trouble, the cry goes from their lips, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Quoting Psalm 22, just as Christ did. So that experience that Christ had on the cross, the 144,000 will go through a similar experience, right? They, they, but, and, and like Christ, they will be victorious. So this is why Satan, everything that he is doing is preparing the way for his masterpiece of deception. Now, you know, when I've thought about this in the past, especially when I first became an Adventist and started thinking about this, uh, it seemed pretty clear to me that this test is a real test. That is, we studied last night about the nature of Christ. Was it possible for Christ to be tempted, was he tempted? Could he have sinned? Yes. Okay. So, so that means he wasn't play acting, right? He wasn't just pretending to take upon himself human nature, but did verily take upon himself our nature in its fallen condition. The 144,000, they don't get holy flesh so that they can't sin. They're going to still have the same nature that they have. The same nature that Christ had, the human nature, the fallen human nature. But they will be victorious by God's spirit. Because if they were just, you know, Christ gave them a new nature so that they didn't sin. Would that, would that test be meaningful? No. No. Right. Satan would win if, if, if the 144,000 were given some nature that couldn't sin, then then the whole thing would be a mockery. It would be needless. Now, I know this is, is controversial within Adventism. And, you know, and I don't know of any direct statements to this effect. I know some scriptures that, uh, that, that I use in Hebrews where it says, you know, without us, they would, could not be made perfect. Talking about uh, why we suffer in, in Hebrews chapter 11. It's going to be the faith chapter. And it says, all these died in faith, ha faith, having not received the promises, that they without us would not be made perfect. And, and the reason why Paul, I believe, is, is uh, talking about this is that, that there is the final generation. It's necessary for the final generation before Christ can return. When Christ's character is perfectly reproduced in his people, then shall he come to claim them as his own. And... Other Christians have no answer to this problem. They don't understand the great controversy. They don't, they don't know why Jesus hasn't come back yet. It, it just, to them, it's just kind of arbitrary. One day he'll just come back. They don't understand that there's a work that has to be done. Now, some will, the, the most common one is what? What do these people most commonly think has to occur before Christ will return? What, what has to happen? They, they take one scripture and uh, use this. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? So Christians who aren't Adventists, if they're going to have some condition that must be fulfilled before Jesus will come back, what is it? The, the temple um, rebuilt. Okay, but, but no, that's something that we have to do. 
I mean, obviously, the Jews, in their mind, the Jews are going to be rebuilding the temple. They think that the gospel has to go to the whole world. Once the, everybody hears the gospel, then Jesus can come back. Have you heard that before? Yeah, many times. Okay. Yeah. We even hear it sort of within Adventism as well. And, and in some ways, there is there is a truth to that because at the at the end times when Christ returns, everyone will have heard the gospel and made a choice one way or the other. Everybody will have made their choice. But that's not why Jesus can come back. He can now come back because it's been demonstrated that what Jesus accomplished on the cross is real. That has to be demonstrated to the world. So I, I know Jacob's here and, and he doesn't know some of this stuff dealing with um, some of the symbolism in scripture, such as the Lord's goat and the scapegoat. So on the Day of Atonement, so we're in the anti-typical Day of Atonement. Once a year, the high priest would go into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, and he would bring, first he would do all these sin offerings on that day um, for, for the priests, for the king, for the, uh, uh, the common people, and um, king, priest, common people, and for the congregation. So there's four different sin offerings. And this is, of course, typical. I'm not going to go into all the symbols of this. But then there would be two goats, and, and they would both be the same. They didn't appear to be different. And one would be, they would cast lots upon the goat, and one would be chosen to be the Lord's goat, and one would be chosen to be Azazel's goat, right, or the scapegoat. So one would fall to the Lord, to Jehovah, and the other one would fall to Azazel. Azazel is uh, a name of a demon in the wilderness. So it's another name for Satan. So one would be the Lord's goat and one would be Satan's goat. Now the Lord's goat, no sins would, it's Leviticus 16, mention the notes there. So the Lord's goat, now all sin offerings have sins confessed upon them, right? Because that's how sins get, God takes the responsibility of sins upon himself when we confess our sins. And that's symbolized by placing the hands upon the animal and confessing sins upon the animal. And then the blood of that animal is brought into the sanctuary and it defiles the sanctuary. And so, um, so with the, the Lord's, the Lord's goat, it's blood. It has no sins confessed upon it and it's blood goes in and cleanses the sanctuary. So it's sprinkled on all the different parts of the sanctuary to cleanse it, to remove those sins, which then go on to the high priest, which represents Christ. And he then confesses those sins upon the head of the scapegoat. And it's this confessing the sins on the head of the scapegoat, which is Satan, after the sanctuary has been cleansed, that Satan then suffers his punishment, which is to be a thousand years on this earth after everybody's been killed. There's nobody here for a thousand years. Uh, but the point here is that um, uh, when we're dealing with the Lord's goat, we, we can see that the Lord Lord's goat represents Christ. And we can see that, that the scapegoat represents Satan and at, at the end of the world symbolically. But also we can see that all those who reject righteousness are tied to the scapegoat and all who accept Christ's righteousness and are saved are connected to the Lord's goat. That is the Lord's goat, I believe, represents that final generation at the end of the world who reflect Christ's character. So it's not, so that's the way that I understand it. I don't know if anybody's heard that explanation of it. Um, so, so the Lord's goat represents the completed work of Christ and his people. And so when we can see that, that all of this spiritualistic ideas, all of this, these, these teachings that people are following that are mixed with Christianity, they are leading people away from obedience to God and uh, to think of themselves as better than they are, to do things that they believe are are valuable. And a lot of them uh, on, a, on the surface can appear to be good. So, so it's just something to think about. Satan is preparing people because he wants to, uh, he wants to destroy the work of Christ, what Christ has done. Okay, so 
Anyway, we're going to read a bit more here. We've got about 15 minutes more. After what event can we expect a special manifestation of his marvelous workings? So by the decree into inter, I, I always try reading too fast. By the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God, our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness. When Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp hand, the hand of the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp hands with spiritualism, when, under the influence of this threefold union, our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government, and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions, then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and that the end is near. So, so we know that this is going to occur, that Satan will up the ante, so to speak, at this time when we see uh, the violation of the Constitution in regard to the institution of the papacy here, here is referring to the enforcement of Sunday. Will the evil spirits advocate the keeping of the Sabbath or Sunday? The miracle working power manifested through spiritualism will exert its influence against those who choose to obey God rather than men. Communications from the spirits will declare that God has sent them to convince the rejectors of Sunday of their error, affirming that the laws of the land should be obeyed as the law of God. Through what particular means will Satan deceive many? Fearful sights of a supernatural character will soon be revealed in the heavens and in token of the power of miracle working demons. Persons will arise pretending to be Christ himself and claiming the title and worship would belong, which belongs to the world's redeemer. They will perform wonderful miracles of healing and will profess to have revelations from heaven contradicting the testimony of scriptures. The sick will be healed before us. Miracles will be performed in our sight. Are we prepared for the trial which awaits us when the lying wonders of Satan shall be more fully exhibited? Satan can, through a species of deceptions, perform wonders that will appear to be genuine miracles. It was this he hoped to make a test question with the Israelites at the time of their deliverance from Egypt. So we saw this happening in, um, in Egypt. We saw the, um, uh, the magicians performing these miracles that uh, imitated the miracles that Moses was, was doing, right? So, uh, and, you know, um, and, and some of them dealing with, uh, one was the serpent when Moses uh, had his, uh, his staff turn into a serpent, the Egyptian magicians, they turned their staffs into serpents. But what happened to the magician's serpents? Eaten by the other. Yeah, Moses' serpent, his staff ate their serpents, and then he picked up his staff again. But, you know, so one of the things that when we look at um, what's happening in the world today, so there are, you know, there are people who are atheists, they don't believe in God, Um you know, they say, well, if God could perform miracles, then I would believe. Is if people are going to be convinced by miracles, they could be deceived, right? So God is not now presently doing miracles. He did them in the past. And I'm not saying God doesn't do miracles, but more public miracles or open miracles. Um, he did them in the past. Were they sufficient in getting people to follow God? The Israelites, they saw the Red Sea parted. They saw um, the Jordan parted. They saw what happened to Egypt, right, with the plagues. Did that elicit in them complete obedience to God's law? They saw the law given from Mount Sinai. They made a promise, all that the Lord has said we'll, we will do and be obedient. Did Was that enough? to have them obey God. Now, they died in the wilderness, right? They So when we think about it, people think miracles would be what would convince them. And it might convince them on an intellectual level. 
But that's not sufficient to change the human heart. And so God has illustrated that in the past. So the work that God wants to do is, is on a more personal level. That is the battleground of the heart where we struggle with our nature. When we, we see that there's something in us that we cannot control. That is the strong evidence of God's power. Oh, man, I'm thinking of Christ when he was sent by Pilate to Herod, and Herod hoped to see a miracle. Yeah, yeah. Done by him. And Christ just stood there as if he were dumbfounded, you know. He would not do it. So that proves that Christ had already shown who he was by his words and actions to Herod. And there was no more to be done for him. We need to exercise faith in God. God is trying to develop a trust in him. And, and you know, some people think it's a cop out for Christians, you know, when we say this type of thing. But in, in reality, it's just the way it is. You know, the Christian life is a hard life. And in some ways, you know, a worldly life is an easier life, at least for a time. But the peace that you have knowing God outweighs any of the trials. The reward is, is greater than the sacrifice. But those who don't want to make the sacrifice and want to have the reward now really can never enjoy it. You know, you can have peace, I guess, you know, in, in a worldly sense for a time. But not that internal peace. You know, we can quiet our conscience, but it's always going to catch up with us. Does he really heal the sick? That's the question regarding Satan's miracles. Wonderful scenes with which Satan will be closely connected will soon take place. And God's word, word declares that Satan will work miracles. He will make people sick and then will suddenly remove from them his satanic power. They will then be regarded as healed. These works of apparent healing will bring Seventh-day Adventists to the test, and of course, many other people. Now, uh, I experienced something similar to this one time. Um, this would be back in 1988. I was at a camp meeting where this uh, guy was teaching that he hadn't sinned since March, and this was in the summertime. And, um, you know, and, and I understand, you know, that we see ourselves as a sinner, right? We don't see ourselves as righteous, and what ended up happening to me personally was was really odd in that, uh, at least apparent to my eyes, uh, Satan just withdrew all of his temptations. He wanted me to see myself as righteous. And, you know, this guy was saying, you know, if we have enough faith, you know, we can overcome and we should we should be victorious over sin. And, you know, he hadn't sinned since March and it's like, you know, June or something. And. um and so it was really interesting, but I knew it was a deception of Satan. I knew that me seeing myself as righteous didn't mean anything. Uh, it was just something Satan wanted to do. Everything was so easy to follow God. He just withdrew his, his and I think for some people he does that. You know, he deceives us in different ways. But because I knew God's word, I knew it was just a deception that me seeing myself as righteous didn't mean anything. I know I'm not righteous, right? I know that I can have Christ's righteousness and that I can overcome, but not in that way, not in this sort of, you know, miracle way, getting some kind of new nature. So, so Satan wants to deceive us, and that's the power that he has. Satan doesn't really have any power other than the power of deception, right? Now, of course, people can put themselves under that power, right? And they can work for Satan, uh, men under the influence of evil spirits will work miracles. They will make people sick by casting their spell upon them and will remove the spell, leading others to say that those who were sick have been miraculously healed. This Satan has done again and again. He will take possession of human bodies and make men and women sick. And then he will suddenly cease to exercise his evil power and it will be proclaimed that a miracle has been wrought. Now, you know, of course, we don't see a lot of this type of spiritualistic activity presently very often, at least not in a public way. Um, but uh, Bill Versage, who was a missionary to uh, Papua New Guinea, um, uh, he, he'd come to Alberta, did a series uh, talking about his experiences there. And, and he had lots of interesting stories about uh, the witch doctors in, um, in New Guinea. Uh, and traveling from village to village. So he'd go places where, you know, 
white men rarely ever went and, uh, and, and, and do missionary work to these different villages. It's very humorous in a lot of ways. But um, he saw that there was uh, real power in these witch doctors in casting spells. So he was in one village and the witch doctor was casting some spell and, you know, it was on a specific day. And uh, they said, well, who's, who's he casting the spell on? They said, well, it's this guy in this other village because uh, he had the guy's fingernails and hair. He had got the guy's fingers, nails and hair, and you can use this to cast a spell upon this person. And so they traveled a couple of weeks journey to this other village. When they got there, they found that the guy had died and, and that he had died at that very moment when this guy was, because the exact same time of day and the same date, uh, when this witch doctor was casting the spell. So he saw that there was uh, something spiritualistic about it that was real, but he also understood God's power to overcome uh, you know, the power of Satan. So in one of his other stories where they went to a village um, to preach the gospel and there was uh, a Sanguma tree. So they call the witch doctor a Sanguma man and there's a Sanguma tree and they have smoked bodies. So the, when the Sanguma man kills people, he takes their bodies and smokes them and then hangs them on this tree. And so a uh, Bill of Versage and the guy he was with, uh, they slept under the tree to show that God had power. You can't touch the tree, but he you know, put his feet on the tree and slept under the tree. It's a very interesting story. I don't have time to tell the whole story. But he saw that God had greater power than Satan. But when people don't know the power of God, and all they know is the power of Satan, they can live in, in great fear. So it is something you know, that we have to think about, that there is satanic powers. But really what Satan is doing is deceiving. Sure, he does things, right? People can be killed by spells and so forth. But he can't do anything if we submit ourselves to God. And it's not like we submit ourselves to God because we're scared of Satan or demons or anything like that. It's just that we recognize that Satan, what he has done is deceived. And if we can take away that deception, we can take away his power. Um, can we expect a cessation of these lying wonders once they have begun? We are warned in the last days that he will work with signs and lying wonders, and he will continue these wonders until the close of probation, that he may point to them as evidence that he is an angel of light and not of darkness. So Ellen White says that's going to be the close of probation, that that will occur. Um, Angela put a verse there, James 4, verse 7. Which I don't have memorized, but I'll find it here. Uh, submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. I found me. that true so often. Yeah. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Right. So, I mean, this is not just talking about Satan as far as what he's going to do to us badly, but just the temptations that come to us. Because God has grace. Um, so if we submit to God, we can overcome. So any, any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay. Well, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you again for the time that we've had on the Sabbath to read and to contemplate the things in your word. We know, Lord, that um, we have a battle ahead of us each day but we are thankful for the Sabbath and the rest that we can have in Christ. We ask that we can learn of his meekness and lowliness and that we can have rest unto our souls. Be with each person. I ask for your spirit to abide with them, for your angels to watch over them, and that you can bring us together again to study your word according to thy will. And we pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.